Have you ever seen one of those stories, or I guess read one of those stories about people who see Jesus everywhere, see Jesus in all kinds of things? Uh, perhaps you've seen the one of Jesus in the potato chip. Now, if you saw this chip, first of all, would you think that's Jesus? And second, would you eat the potato chip? Gives a whole new meaning to communion, I think. Uh, I'm not sure that that looks like Jesus or not. But then there's one, and I've seen this one before. There are several versions of this. One of them is Jesus that appears in the fog of like a shower glass or a mirror. And you can look and see that that would be Jesus appearing to you. You might think you're peering into the mirror to look at yourself and you see the image of Jesus. What a great way to start the day. But for this particular person, it was Jesus in the mildew in the shower. Okay? So I don't know what to make of that. Um, maybe it's okay to have that much mildew in your shower because Jesus will appear. As I look at that picture of Jesus, Jesus looks quite frightened. Uh, it looks like the scream picture, uh, Edward Munch, of, of Jesus. Uh, then, and this is probably my all-time favorite, uh, and it might happen to you. It might have happened to you as you were uh, ironing your clothes this past week, but it is Jesus in the iron fungus. Uh, the grime that gets onto an iron. I don't know. That, uh, that one is also a bit of a stretch. And I'm not sure that Jesus really wants to appear to you while you're ironing. But all this leads us to wonder, uh, how is it that we really know what Jesus looks like? I mean, to begin with, how do we know that that's what Jesus looked like? Well, we don't really know, do we? And probably most of the pictures that we identify that would be Jesus are not what Jesus would have looked like at all. And so that is a constant challenge for us. But it also reminds us that our perception of who Jesus looks like or what Jesus looks like is probably based on someone else's description of Jesus. Maybe if you're like me, when you were growing up, in your church somewhere in the hallway, there was a picture of Jesus, and I meant to include that one in today. Uh, there was one, uh, whenever I would go up to the third or yeah, third floor of our church building, I would look down the hallways. I was on my way to Sunday school, and at the end of the hallway was this huge picture, this painting of Jesus. It's the 70s blonde Jesus. Well, it's blondish, brownish, sandy blonde Jesus that's at the end of the hallway. And it's a beautiful picture. And I also had a miniature picture of it that I kept in my wallet. And uh, I don't know why I kept it in my wallet, but I could, I guess, pull it out and look and see Jesus there in the picture. Uh, but we've all developed some idea about who Jesus is, probably based on someone else's description. Well, what we've heard today in our gospel text is uh, a help for us in understanding more about Jesus and an invitation for us to be able to see who Jesus is for ourselves. This invitation to come and see, as Philip would give to Nathaniel. So as we look back at this text in our gospel text, uh, we see that there is this encounter that, that Philip and Nathaniel have with Jesus. First of all, it begins with Jesus saying to Philip, follow me, Philip. Come on with me where I'm going. I want you to follow me. I want you to be a disciple of mine. I want you to, to go with me to learn more about what it is that God is doing in the world, about the kingdom of God and what that looks like in our world. So Philip, don't just sit there. Follow me. And Philip does, doesn't he? Philip gets right up and begins to go along with him. In fact, Philip is so excited about Jesus that he goes and tells Nathaniel. And Nathaniel, who is sitting under a tree, 
begins to kind of push back on this with Philip, because Philip's like, hey, I found the one. I found the Messiah. This guy is the one. He's the one we've been waiting for. He's the one that our parents and our grandparents and our teachers and everybody's been talking about for all this time. This one who is going to come and deliver us. He's going to lead us to a better place. He's going to care for us. He's, he's going to help us to be our Messiah. Nathaniel's like, I don't know about that. Where's he from? Oh, he's from Nazareth. Wait, he's from where? He's from Nazareth? You know, Nazareth was this little insignificant community, maybe several hundred people lived in, kind of a backwoods community. And I thought about comparing it to communities around here, but I didn't want to get anybody upset with me uh, writing letters about communities that might be compared with Nazareth. But Nazareth was not really where Nathaniel was thinking this great Messiah was going to come from. And so he says, what good comes from Nazareth. What are you talking about, Philip? That's not where God's going to do this great thing and going to send this new king that we're going to have, this new anointed one, this new Messiah. And so he says, come and see, Nathaniel. That's what Philip says, come and see. Don't just listen to me. And don't just base this on your own preconceived notions about where the Messiah is to come from, but come and see, Nathaniel. And so he does. He gets up and he goes. And on his way, he, uh, Jesus sees him coming and Jesus calls out to him. And it really kind of takes Nathaniel back. How did you know it was me? How did you know? And he says, look, I saw you sitting under the tree. And there is this epiphany that goes on. There is this aha moment. Wow, there is something different about this guy. And he calls out and he says, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. And there is this conversation that goes back and forth as he comes to see what God is doing right there in this man Jesus, who is standing before him and talking to him. The first text that we heard this morning from 1 Samuel is that wonderful story about Samuel. Uh, And you know, his mother has left him there at the temple there with Eli, uh, the priest, and he used to be raised up as one who has been called by God. He has been dedicated over to God by his mother. And so Samuel is there, and he's asleep, and he hears this voice calling to him, and he's not sure where this voice is coming from. He thinks maybe it's Eli. So he goes down the hallway, and he says, yes, you you called me. Here I am. You called me. And he says, no, I didn't call you. Go back to bed. And this happens a couple of more times. But when he finally understands that this is God calling him, what is it that he says? We've already heard it in our music this morning uh, as Bill uh, picked one of the the hymns that really uh, fits in with this text. Thank you, Bill. Here I am is what he says. As he hears God calling him, Samuel, Samuel, here I am. Speak, God, for your servant is listening. I'm listening to you. And I believe that you are speaking to me. There is this epiphany that he has, or a theophany, where God appears, God speaks, God is manifested in something right there before him. And so we understand more about this invitation that God is always giving to us. In this season of epiphany, we are reminded of our invitation to come and to see for ourselves. And I wonder this morning, do you really believe that God is speaking to you? Do you really believe that God still does things like that? That God could still call you by your name in the middle of your sleep or as you're driving down the road or as you're eating a meal or doing something else, God speaks to you. And you could have this epiphanal 
moment. Do you really believe that? Well, as we go into this new year, I hope that we do. I hope that we are having a great bit of anticipation about what it is that God will say to us. And if ever we should be listening, it is right now. We bemoaned 2020, and rightly so. But are we really off to that much better of a year in 2021? (laughs) We still need God, don't we? We still need to hear from God and what God has to say to us. Well, how do we do that? How is it that we could get to a place where we can do that? Well, first of all, let me say there are a few things we hear from this story about Philip and Nathaniel that can help us today. And the first is don't settle for a preconceived notion about Jesus. Don't just settle for that like Philip or like Nathaniel did as he's sitting under the tree, like, no, that can't be right, Philip. You could not have encountered this one that we've been looking for all along. It couldn't be the Christ, couldn't be the Messiah, because he would never come from Nazareth. He was operating off of a false notion that he had about how this would take place and about who this Messiah would be. And we do that as well, don't we? We have certain assumptions about Jesus. Maybe it is how we were raised. Maybe it's a particular denomination that we were in or a particular tradition or maybe stories that we heard from people around us. And we develop certain assumptions about who Jesus is. Maybe it's by looking at culture. Maybe it's uh, based on um, something we learned in vacation Bible school or something that someone told us. But chances are we have developed limitations about who Jesus is. And if we stop right there, we are not progressing in our faith. We're not developing into who God wants us to be. And we need to move beyond those limitations. And that really leads us to the second thing. And that is don't rely on someone else's account or view of Jesus. And Nathaniel didn't, right? He didn't go, okay, Philip, that sounds really good. I'm going to go along with that just because you said it. No, Nathaniel, much like Thomas later, who doubted and needed to put his hands in the side of Christ to be able to really believe, we are also to move beyond someone else's account and view and to get to the point where we come and see where we see for ourselves who Jesus is. And we need to do this, especially if it doesn't match up with the Gospels. If our view of Jesus or the view that we have heard does not match up with the Gospels, then we need to go see for ourselves. Now this is a real problem, isn't it? And we're seeing this as a real problem today in our nation. Today, in churches all across our nation, as so many people in churches, Christian churches, have bought into conspiracy theories. And if you don't believe me, just look at some of the people that have been arrested in the last week. And uh, some things that have been said from pulpits and things that have been said from pulpits the last four years. And this QAnon conspiracy, and a lot of people are wondering, how is it that someone, especially uh, a Christian, could buy into such garbage and to be brainwashed in such a way to believe these crazy things? Well, I think that's something we really need to look at. And we need to come to understand that we need to dig deeper into who Jesus is. We need to look beyond Uh, our preconceived notions, or maybe what other people are telling us, and we need to dig deeper in an understanding and be grounded in the gospel presentation of who Jesus is. Because there are all different kinds of competing versions and views of who Jesus is. For example, white Jesus Uh, If your notion about who Jesus is is 
a white Jesus, then you've missed the gospel presentation of who Jesus is, right? Well, we know that Jesus wasn't white, and we know that we tend to rely upon European paintings of, of Jesus as maybe someone who was Dutch, like Rembrandt, or, or someone else. They're, they're painting Jesus within their own culture and context and their own understanding. But I think even certainly they knew that Jesus was not white. And as we look at that, we need to understand what that does to us if we base our view of Jesus on a white European view of who Jesus was. Certainly we need to include that, and we need to learn from that, but there's so many other versions of who Jesus is as well. And we need to study Jesus within his context, his own time, his own culture. And when we don't, this is what leads to things like white supremacy. And we know that white supremacy is rampant in our nation. It is a part of our history, and it is something that we have yet to deal with in the right way. And so we need to move beyond that to come and see who Jesus really is. But that ties in with the American Jesus as well. If your Jesus is wrapped in an American flag, then you have the wrong Jesus, or any flag for that matter. And we need to understand the limitations of an American Jesus. We, on Wednesday night, looked at Christian nationalism. Again, is that something that is such a huge problem that is, going, that, that is the foundation for much of what is going on right now? in our nation. Christian nationalism. It is not the church that Jesus created. It is not uh, according to the gospel of Jesus. And we looked at some of the tenets of that and talked about what it is that we can do to work against that in our nation. Also, the John Wayne Jesus. I like this one. Now, I don't know if you saw some of these flags flying at the Capitol uh, siege uh, last week or two weeks ago, but there were a, a couple of them that had uh, John Wayne on there and the American flag, and, uh, and then you would see these mixed in with Christian flags and Jesus saves flags and, and all of this. It's the John Wayne Jesus. There's a, a great book that is out there by Kristen Cobes Dume called John Wayne and Jesus. And if you look at this, you'll, you'll get a better understanding about how we have developed this masculine, very patriarchal view of Jesus. And we equate him pretty much to be like John Wayne, right? He's the cowboy Jesus. And if we have that view of Jesus, we've missed who Jesus really is. And then the violent Jesus. The Jesus that would go after the Capitol building and threaten people, and seek to kill people. And we have a very violent version of Jesus in our nation. Did you know that just uh, two days ago, uh, there was hopefully the last federal execution, all by a, what has been purported to be a pro-life president who has executed more people than any president in 120 years. That makes the 13th uh, killing, uh, federal execution in these last four years. That is not the version of Jesus that we find in the Gospels at all. And how can we as a church, churches, say that we are pro-life when we are supporting the killing of people? That's not Jesus at all. And so we need to make sure that we are not relying on someone else's account or view. No, you must see for yourself. So I've mentioned two don'ts, but let me give you a do. Do take a look at Jesus for yourself. For yourself. Dig into the Gospels. That would be a great New Year's resolution for us all, wouldn't it? To say, I'm going to really dig deeper in the Gospels. And right now in the lectionary, we're going through Mark, even though today we're in John. 
we're, we're going to be looking at Mark, and, and we're going to be always in the Gospels in this next year. And my challenge to you would be to dig deeper in the Gospels. Read them every day. Make sure you're staying there and you're journeying along with Jesus, that you're seeing Jesus from the perspective of other people in the Gospels, the people that he heals, the people that he forgives, the people that he loves, the people that he speaks out against, all of that, that you make sure that you're digging deeper. And also that you're dialoguing with Jesus as you're doing that. One of the uh, exercises we did one time with our storytelling was to enter ourselves into a, a parable or into a gospel text, a soliloquy where we are dialoguing with Jesus. And that's a great thing to do. Sometimes just take a piece of paper out and start writing. Uh, this, Jesus is saying this, and then I'm going to say this to Jesus, and then Jesus says this, and I'm going to say it. Just do some creative writing and talking to Jesus on paper and see what happens. It will be an exciting time, and I think you will learn a lot by doing that. And then by listening to Jesus, just listening to the words of Jesus over and over again. And then doing like Nathaniel did, confess Jesus. And you might say, well, I've already confessed Jesus as my Lord and Savior. We'll do it again. Just keep doing it. Just keep saying, Jesus, like Nathaniel, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the King. You are my King. You are my Lord. You are my Savior. And confess who it is that you believe Jesus to be based on what you have encountered. And then act on what you see. Go ahead and act on it, like Philip did. He went and started telling everybody around him about Jesus. And I'm pretty sure Nathaniel did the same thing too. Act on it. One of the things that we uh, consider during this Martin Luther King weekend is um, just about his life, his amazing life, the fact that he was willing to not just settle for a preconceived notion about Jesus, but he dug in deeper to learn more about Jesus. A Jesus that didn't seek power, but emptied himself to serve other people. It wasn't about power, and, and Dr. King saw that, and he sought to exemplify that in his own life as well. He found a Jesus who didn't exclude strangers, but included everybody. Sinners and all, Jesus included everybody. King found uh, a Jesus who didn't take up arms, but resisted with his nonviolent, peacemaking resistance. And that is something that he had to think about a lot as people continued to threaten his own life, as he would be beaten, and as people in his movement would be beaten because they were black. He didn't take up arms because Jesus didn't take up arms. And he allowed that to inform his view and how he moved forward to change history. He found a Jesus who didn't hate his enemies, but loved them. And Dr. King would talk over and over about love and the power of love over hate. And he found a Jesus who didn't cower to bullies, but he spoke truth to power. And all of this informed his life in such a way that he would make a difference because of it. In his book titled Welcoming Justice, Charles Marsh describes one of King's profound encounters with the risen Christ. In January 1956, Martin Luther King returned home around midnight after a long day of organizational meetings. His wife and young daughter were already in bed, and King was eager to join them but a threatening call, the kind of call he was getting as many as 30 or 40 times a day. It interrupted his attempt to get some much needed rest. When he had tried to go back to bed, he could not shake the menacing voice that kept repeating the hateful words in his head. So King got up, he made a pot of coffee, sat down at his kitchen table, and with his head buried in his hands, he cried out to God. There in his kitchen in the middle of the night, when he had come to the end of his strength, King met the living Christ 
in an experience that would carry him through the remainder of his life. He says, I heard the voice of Jesus saying, still to fight on. Keep fighting on. King later recalled, he promised never to leave me, never to leave me alone. He promised never to leave me, no, never alone. In the stillness of the Alabama night, the voice of Jesus proved more convincing than the threatening voice of the anonymous caller, Marsh says. The voice of Jesus gave him the courage to press through the tumultuous year of 1956 to the victorious end of the Montgomery bus boycott. More than that, it gave him a vision for ministry that would drive him for the rest of his life. It's what kept him going. The fact that he went to see Jesus and Jesus met him there. As we enter a brand new year, that's what will keep us going as well. And if you ever wonder, how am I going to make it another year? Let that be an encouragement to you. Let that be an invitation to you to come and to see Jesus. Let us go to him in prayer.